Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So I'm here to talk about I Libertine, they night people. And as a warning, the names have not been changed to protect anyone. And one of those names we're not protecting is the main character of this story, Gene Shep Shepard. Shep, as they call him, is most famous to most people as the man who co-scripted and narrated A Christmas Story. However, what I want to focus on is Shep's time as a radio host for WOR in New York City. Now, as a programming note, I want to say that a lot of this story is sourced from a 1968 radio interview, a full, like, 12 years after the fact, on fellow WOR broadcaster Long John Neville's radio show. All right, so, after start working as a radio host in a few different cities around the U.S., Shep comes to New York and starts broadcasting in the overnight slot. Due to a profound lack of budget, rather than including much in the way of music or guests, Shep instead spent his show musing on his new home and society at large, late at night while most of the world was asleep. During this time, he created a term for his fans and the other creative, interesting weirdos whose day doesn't really start until the sun goes down. <laughs> the night people. The night people's natural enemy is, of course, the day people. And what's crazy is that the day people don't know that the night people exist. For the day people are the ones who work a nine to five job, go home, slump down in front of the TV, and as far as they're concerned, the day is done. Even though for the night people, the day really, this is when the day really begins. Though, think those identically dressed corporate conformists, soap opera housewives, and any other, uh, blah, 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 and any other, anyone out there who would uh, answer to, oh, God damn it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, soap opera housewives, and anyone out there who would believe what they saw in the papers, listen to their government, or any other quote unquote authority. They're the kind of folks who won't go to a show unless there's 100 people in front of the box office, who think that a $5,000 car is five times better than a $1,000 car, even if the transmission is made of balsa wood. The day people are the people of lists and statistics, and I'm not sure how much I agree with this, but damn it, I'm mad now. And in fact, in Shep's opinion, New York was the city of lists. How do we know what the best-selling book is? Well, it must be whatever is at the top of the list of the paper. If the paper says it's a hit, then it is. Though the people who compile the lists are mortal. We all have our own motives and uh, needs that affect what we do. So if I have a huge stockpile of books, a huge stockpile of books that aren't selling, what's to stop me from saying that it, it, the book is selling great, so it appears higher on the bestseller list, and letting me sell my overstock to the rubes. Nothing. Well, Shep decided to show them the flaw of their ways and also that the night people were out there. During a show one night, while all the people, all the people who believe in lists were asleep, he hatched a plot that him and his listeners would go into bookstores and ask for a book they know doesn't exist. Because what's going to happen is that the first person is going to go in and ask for the book, then the cashier would look through their lists and see that the book isn't there, then say that the book doesn't exist. So in a huff, the customer will say, well, then I'll go buy it somewhere else. But when that second person comes through and asks for the book, the cashier will be like, oh, um, it's on order. <laughs> then it's... <laughs> Then as more and more people come in, all these bookstores start calling their suppliers asking for this book. And the process will repeat itself. Then all those suppliers start calling up the chain. And within 20 minutes, Publishers Weekly will collapse in a pile of rubble. <laughs> this was to be a collaborative effort. Listeners started phoning in with suggestions for the plot characters, author, and title. The only rule was that it had to be pretentious. <laughs> Callers as far away as Alaska called in with ideas. Finally, at 4.30 in the morning, the title was decided. I, Libertine. 
first volume in a trilogy on 18th century court life. Uh, <laughs> the author is quite surprised by the success of his book since it was written for scholars. He, of course, hopes that no one will misunderstand chapters that are there for purely scholarly reasons. Then, if anybody asks, tell them it's printed by Excelsior Press, a subsidiary of Cambridge University imprint. For as Shep put it when we're counting his story, there is not a bookseller out there that can argue with Cambridge. <laughs> there was, of course, a fake author to go with the fake book, Frederick R. Ewing. Now, Mr. Ewing was an Oxford graduate married to Marjorie, an equine enthusiast from the North Country. <laughs> and pri also, prior to World War II, he contributed to various British publications and had a BBC series on erotica in the 18th century. <laughs> During the war, Mr. Ewing was part of the Royal Navy, serving aboard minesweepers in the North Atlantic. In 1940, retiring in 1946 at the rank of commander. He went back to his career as a civil servant. While working as a civil servant stationed in Rhodesia, Ms. Ewing completed his work on I Libertine. Now, for those, with you, for those of you with a keen eye, you'll notice that isn't Mr. Ewing in the photo, but our own Gene Shepard. With the plot set, it was time for the book to make its debut. The philosophy of the day people, referred to as creeping meatballism by Shepard for reasons I don't quite understand, was now under full assault. Double day in New York, double days in New York, got 27 calls for I Libertine in one morning. Another night person got I Libertine into the books to be published list in the Times Sunday section. A DJ in Pennsylvania gave Frederick Ewing the Burbage Award for outstanding historical research <laughs> and interviewed the author on air. Activated in the name of chaotic good, well, chaotic neutral, <laughs> the, um, the night people were out in force doing all they could to make this fake book a success. But what's even better? is that the day people, seeing that something had buzz and was in lists, had to get in on the action. One listener mentioned the book at a bridge club, then three other ladies started discussing the book. Two of them hated it. <laughs> Another listener requested the book from a know-it-all cashier, who upon hearing the title said, about time Ewing is getting his due. <laughs> at Columbia University, a student submitted a review of I Libertine as his thesis. He got it back with a B plus and was returned by the teacher with the word Excelsior on it. Excelsior being the catchphrase of the night people and as far as I know, unrelated to Stan Lee. So this professor was in on the plan. <laughs> However, at an unnamed university in New Jersey, another student had a similar idea their nine page paper with footnotes was returned with an excellent grade and a note that they had done superb research. <laughs> Info about the book began to appear in various book, section, book sections in various newspapers all over, including one article where a writer who was definitely not in on the joke claimed to have had lunch with the author on a train ride to India. I could list examples all day. Uh, <laughs> it's such a funny and eye-opening experience to find all these people who we now find out have just been bullshitting us the entire time. However, no prank can last forever. And this little gag soared to heights higher than anyone, even Shep himself could not have imagined. It's like a guy who stands at the base of a mountain and says to himself, gee, I wonder what would happen if I threw a pebble up there. And he throws one up there. And the next thing you know, he's got a 420 trillion ton avalanche coming down on him. Eventually, <laughs> right? Uh, eventually, after the coaxing of a listener, the prank began to be revealed in the papers, letting the world of the day know that they had had one pulled over on him, on them. Funnily enough though, this is not quite where our story ends. 
Sometime later on, Ballantine Books approached Shep with the idea of actually writing I, Libertine. <laughs> Shep agreed and also decided to donate all the profits to charity. Using the plot and ideas dreamed up with the help of Shep and his night people, and working with a sci-fi writer named Theodore Sturgeon, an accomplished writer in his own right, they actually wrote, I, Libertine. <laughs> it was turbulent, turgid, temptuous. Um, and you must believe me when I tell you this story is true. All the wild things and reactions from listeners, the little details that don't quite make sense. To paraphrase the back cover of the British hardcover version, we do not vouch for the accuracy of this talk, which is quoted from American sources. So, here's the Gene Shepherd and his night people. All fans that push creative endeavors to greater heights and the weirdos out there ready and willing to poke society in the eye. Excelsior. Now, Aaron, before you go anywhere, I have, I have a very important question for you. Oh. You realize this is your third talk. You know what that means. Yeah. Will you have us? Will you become a fellow of Absalon? I will, yeah, man, let's do this. <laughs> I, allow me. One of us. One of us. One of them. <laughs> One more time, Excelsior. <laughs>